every generation has its uh, humanitarian catastrophe. And our catastrophe is Syria. Mostly, people don't understand the humanitarian catastrophe when it happens in their time. It's only really understood as history. When it's raw political facts, people don't really understand it. They do, don't really understand what is going on at that time. And they often say afterwards, I wish I'd known then what I know now. So for example, when things happen in Rwanda, multiple warnings were missed at that time. Lots of peacekeepers were withdrawn. In Bosnia at the same time in the mid 90s, the argument was made that they were all as bad as each other. In Darfur, the argument was made that for centuries these people had been fighting against each other. And so people were able to shrug their shoulders and walk a circle around the humanitarian catastrophe that they were experiencing. And what we try to teach our children, really, is, at the end of the day, empathy. We try to teach them compassion. We try to teach them fellow feeling. What we consider the higher qualities that distinguish us from the other animals on this planet. And when we see it in our children, we swell with pride. But sometimes we are confronted with these lessons ourselves. Our conscience is tested. We test the deeper dimensions of our fellow feeling for people suffering in other parts of the world. And I think that we're failing that test in relation to Syria. And I think we really have to confront this question as to why there are no university roundtables, there are no petitions to parliament, there are no protests outside embassies, there is no fundraising going on, there is no letters to the paper. Why the apathy, why the inertia in relation to something as grave as this? So let's look at other people's view. This is Valerie Amos. She's the head of the UN in terms of humanitarianism. And she has said that an entire generation of children has been traumatized and brutalized. This is Samantha Power, the US ambassador to the UN. And she has said, as you can see there, that this is the worst humanitarian catastrophe of our era on our watch. And Valerie Amos again, she says that 150 years of humanitarian principles have been eroded because of what has happened in Syria and because of our failure to provide any political solution and our failure to reach the humanitarian needs of the people there. And add to that the voice of Antonio Guterres, who is the U head of the UNHCR. And he has said that it's the worst humanitarian catastrophe since the Cold War. So don't take my word for it. Now, I visited Syria last year. I went over the border and spoke with some of our beneficiaries and our staff. And one of our staff, Davy Adams met these two boys, Mohammed and Badir. Mohammed is nine and Badir is six. And they were playing um, on a pile of rubble. And it turned out that um, a bomb had struck their house, but they were playing outside, so they, uh, they survived with small injuries. Um, but all of their family were inside the house, and they were killed, parents, brothers, and sisters. And they were playing on this pile of rubble, and under that rubble were their parents and their family and their brothers and sisters. And later that day, we went to a hospital and we met an eight-year-old girl. She had lost a limb and she was bandaged. And she was calling softly for her mother. And she um, was sedated. Uh, and it would fall to a health worker sometime later on when the sedation wore off to tell her that her mother hadn't survived. And these are the innocent victims of war, and they have very profound humanitarian need. And the question we have to confront is why we don't have that sense of fellow feeling for their suffering. Why this inertia? Uh, that is the paradox that I want to confront today. And when I visited Syria, it's just an amazing country. Um, it's the cradle of Christianity. The last place in the world where the language of Jesus, Aramaic, is still spoken is in, in an area around uh, Malula, just north of Damascus. It's the place where the alphabet came from. It is the Tigris and the Euphrates over in the eastern side, Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization itself. So it's a tremendously rich cultural tradition. It is a tremendous tradition of political toleration, of religious toleration. But that has all been wiped away uh, in the last three years in this conflict. And the numbers are very, very bad. We have 160,000 that have been killed as far as we know. Uh, three million people have had to leave the country as refugees, and 
six million are internally displaced within Syria. And when I speak to my staff, many of whom come from Aleppo, what they miss most about living in Aleppo, they say they miss the sense of community, they miss the sense of home, they miss the sense of belonging, which is now being, uh, where they now live in, uh, in camps, where they now live in refugee camps. And in spite of the great generosity of the host populations and the neighboring countries, you cannot replicate that sense of belonging. And these are the people that have suffered because uh, of this conflict. And we see it as NGOs because we try to fundraise for this crisis. We have big programs there, but we can't fundraise for it. There isn't any sense that we should help uh, these people whatsoever. There's a great uh, organization in the UK called DEC. They coordinate all the NGOs in terms of fundraising. They raise 95 million pounds for the victims of the typhoon in the Philippines. For the Syria, they raised 20 million pounds. Now, 5,000 people were killed in the Philippines. It was a very severe tragedy, but 160,000 have been killed in Syria, and yet there isn't that sense of fellow feeling. So what, we are tr what I'm trying to explore is why that is the case. And nobody thinks Mohammed and Badir are any more blameworthy because their parents were killed in a bomb attack and not in an earthquake or a tsunami. In fact, their suffering is probably worse. We know that added to mental trauma, added to the physical disfigurement, added to bereavement, is the morally outrageous reality that all of this was avoidable and all of this was caused is man-made. And that's the paradox. Why are we much greater empathy for the things we cannot control, like earthquakes and tsunamis, and so little empathy for things that we could and should control, like war and conflict? And thinkers are beginning to see this now. They're beginning to recognize that the real break on development is conflict and the absence of the rule of law. And in this age of connectivity, why are we no closer to the lives of Muhammad and Badir? Why do we not have any sense of their suffering? In this age of instantaneous communications, we have no more sense of their suffering than if they lived and died a century ago. And it's commonplace for people to say, you know, it is morally indefensible for children to die of curable diseases in circumstances when we have all the medicines in the world. It's morally indefensible for children to die of starvation when we have a time of plenty. But it isn't said often enough that it is morally indefensible for children to die in conflict, as they do all the time. So the question is, why is this? There are a few reasons I'd like to explore. The first reason is to do with a bias against the Middle East and against so, many, so much blood that has been spilt in the Middle East over the last few decades. Whether it's Sunni and Shia conflict, whether it's Arab and Palestinian, whether it is the Bush era awards in Iraq and Afghanistan and more recently in Libya, that just colors people and they say this is the most hopelessly violent part of the world and we don't have a capacity to look beyond the political and see the humanitarian suffering here. I just want to change gear a little bit here and pause and draw on an historical analogy. As we said, I was a student in this university uh, a couple of million years ago, and uh, I had, with mixed results, I have to say, one of my professors wrote that Barry is aware of the fact of history, if not necessarily the facts of history. <laughs> uh, another wrote that uh, Barry's essays display a high awareness of nostalgia and guesswork, and so on. <laughs> and this was the kind of tone that, uh, but I still developed a love of history. So my historical analogy is this, and it might demonstrate my lack of historical awareness. Irish people died of starvation and disease and the Great Famine. And in the worst year of that famine in 1847, the great leader Daniel O'Connell, in the last year of his life, gave up his belligerence towards the British government and he got down on his knees and he pleaded with them to separate that out, the political from the humanitarian. He knew what was happening in his country, but the British dismissed uh, the Irish suffering as being a, an example of the lack of thrift, uh, typical of this violent, superstitious, feckless nation. And this was colored somewhat by this kind of propaganda, as you can see in this cartoon that appeared in Punch in that very year of 1847. You see the comment that is made. He says, spare a trifle, Your Honor, for a poor Irish lad to buy a bit of a blunderbuss with, and it contains in it all of the prejudices that obtained at that time about Irish people. You have him appearing animal-like. He is subject to violence. He is 
uh, he's feckless, he is uh, work shy, all of these prejudices colored British attitudes to the Irish suffering at that time. There was an inability to separate out the political from the humanitarian. And that is the problem I see sometimes with the way that we look at the Arab Middle East conflicts that are occurring right now. But it wasn't all negative. There were some exceptions to the attitude to Irish suffering at that time. Uh, we all know about the Quakers. They were really incredible people, very generous towards charitable causes. Less well known as Queen Victoria. To her credit, she gave 2,000 pounds to Irish Relief at that time. And another remarkable uh, exception was the donation of $710 by the Choctaw Indians, Native American tribe, to Irish Relief back then in 1847. And these people had suffered themselves very recently. But somehow, that suffering didn't blunt their sense of internationalism. And let's think about all of the myriad of excuses they could have made not to engage with the suffering in Ireland. They could have said, it's a, long, it's a terrible long way away. What can we do? We've got our own problems. How do we disentangle the political dimensions of this from the humanitarian? But they said, we recognize suffering, and we're not going to walk a circle around it. We're going to ask questions later. Effectively, what they decided to do was to draw this conclusion. Just because you can't do everything means you can't, you shouldn't do nothing. And so they made their tiny gesture, and this echoes down the generations to today. And here in Dublin, 1992, this plaque was erected to the Choctaw Nation to remember their tiny gesture. And what, what do we learn from this? We have to ask ourselves the questions. Are we walking a circle around the suffering of the people of Syria because of a prejudice? Uh, or not? Are we making excuses for, for that suffering? Uh, are we making excuses for our apathy and our inertia? Uh, that is the question. And this plaque is on the wall in the mansion house. The second possible reason is that it has become so political. It is politically complex what's going on in Syria. This slide here demonstrates the numbers of people that have been killed in Syria. I'm just going to throw up a couple of incidents that have occurred that maybe demonstrate the political complexity of the question. So, in August 2012, Kofi Annan resigned from his position as a UN Arab League mediator for Syria, citing the paralysis of the, Euro uh, the UN Security Council. Uh, later, Navi Pillay says, we're fiddling while Syria burns. Um, in July 2013, the UN stopped counting the casualties because they couldn't verify the numbers. President Obama's famous red line in, July, in August of 2013, crossed with impunity. The UN Independent International Inquiry concluded serious crimes against humanity had been carried out by the Assad government. In January of 2014, Desmond De Silva in the UK QC, in his report, concluded that 11,000 political det detainees had been executed. 11,000 had been executed, and he had proof to show it. He called it industrial scale killing was going on. And in May last month, Russia and China vetoed a UN resolution to allow a war crimes tribunal to follow from this. And by way of coda almost, Lakhtar Brahimi, the UN Arab League mediator, resigns because of paralysis in the UN Security Council. But is it politically complex? No, it's not. It's simple. When mass murder is occurring by a government against its people, that is simple. That requires action, it requires activism, and it requires intervention. It requires the defense of the innocent populations. Uh, it requires protection for humanitarian relief. That is simple. Just because the UN Security Council cannot find a solution to that is no more evidence of complexity than if my cat can't do long division. Um, but we also ask the question, are they as bad as each other? Uh, and people said this around Bosnia in, 2000, in, in 1992, 93. They said, these people really are as bad as each other. Al-Qaeda in one hand, Assad in the other. This is the argument of equivalence. And reasonably informed commentators use this all the time in relation to Syria. But the truth is, the Assad government has carried out such unbelievable crimes against its people. Uh, whether it's barrel bombing, whether it is the use of chemical weapons, whether it is the targeting of innocent populations of women and children, whether it is the targeting of hospitals and universities. These things are happening all the time. And sometimes in the media, 
They talk about indiscriminate targeting. It's not indiscriminate. It would be indiscriminate if there were innocent victims of a, that were collateral damage to a specific military target. But there is no military objective here. There is no legitimate military objective. They are targeting their population, so it's not indiscriminate. And when Obama said, oh, well, give us your chemical weapons, he handed a permission slip to the Assad government to do his worst as long as it didn't involve chemical weapons. And we have that on our conscience. And so the, question, the idea that they're as bad as each other, it doesn't wash, it doesn't hold up to examination. So the equivalence argument has to be rejected. Uh, what do we do, therefore? I'm not an advocate of military intervention. And as you can see, neither are the American people. Uh, neither are the UK. Uh, the British Parliament voted against it, and have to, we have to accept that, and I think it's right. But Samantha Power has said that there is a spectrum, there is a continuum of intervention, things that we can do. And she, she understood that political activism would determine whether or not there was going to be an intervention. So there's a very direct correlation between the inertia among people about this suffering and the question of whether there might, might be any intervention. And we've seen in Mosul how quickly Obama has reacted. But three years of complete inaction in relation to Syria. And the question has to be asked, why? Now, I think there are three things we have to do. The UN Security Council is not fit for purpose. We have to get to a situation where the UN Security Council examines issues on the basis of their merits and not on the basis of national self-interest. We have to change it completely, and we may have to make it fit for purpose. Secondly, there has to be um, a, a determination to protect humanitarian supplies to the people that need it. And at this moment in time, there isn't an appetite for that anywhere. So NGOs like Goal are trying to get in to places in very, very difficult circumstances. There's no media going in there. There are no international staff going in there, just the brave Syrian people who are prepared to risk their lives to bring humanitarian supplies. And if that means a no-fly zone, then that's what has to happen. And finally, what we have to do is develop, redevelop a sense of political activism. And we have to reject the idea that humanitarian suffering as a result of conflict is any less deserving of our sympathy than humanitarian suffering as a result of natural disaster. Because if we don't do that, then we have to ask ourselves honestly the question, what plaque will be raised and erected for us by the freed peoples of Syria? Thank you very much.